Services, Lattice Field is the language um, for this. This is a strategy of technology. And then the goal, or the reason for doing it is to apply this, apply these things to continuum. Set. And these cells are labeled by pairs, 
sigma eta, where sigma is less than or equal to eta. So, for example, this one cell here is this point contained in this edge. And this one cell here corresponds to this edge contained in this face, etc., like that. So that's the pair subdivision. And this is motivated, when, well, there are a lot of things to say about this. idea, and, and, and it, it sort of it leads to a new idea in, in math. The key idea is that if you use this subdivision or the original subdivision, the idea is that you, they contain the same information. That subdivision and that subdivision contain the same information. And this is expressed in the following way. Let's see, if you give this subdivision, so you can call this thing C, call this thing PC, the pair subdivision C. And then if I put a little dot here, this means chains, and if I put the dot up here, it means co-chains. Then there's a natural map, let me just make sure I get this right now. There are natural maps of the chains here. Uh, natural maps from the chains here. A natural math like this, if you, if you take a big chain, you just write it as the sum of the three little chains. So this is just fractured into pieces. Then there's a, a not so obvious map backwards. I'll just call this G. Uh, let me, uh, there's a canonical one that you can make if you introduce denominators, and let me just draw some pictures for it. So, so for example, so you want to map the pieces of this one back out to the coarse one. So, well, the vertices, just, these vertices are just going to stay there. This vertex, well, you have to map it to a vertex. So. A canonical way to do that is to split it into two parts and have half of it there and half there. So I would write that as, well, let's just write this. Half of it goes there and half goes there. Because we're considering convex, I mean, the, the linear combinations of these, say, with rational coefficients, this, this makes sense. So I map this to the sum of this, half this plus half this. And I'll map this one to one third of this plus one third of this plus one third of this, etc. Like that, and, and these three will stay where they are. Then um, let's see, what do the edges do? For example, this edge here goes to one sixth of this edge plus one sixth of this edge, and. Uh, this kind 
composition, you actually get the identity. And if you do this composition here, well, it can't be the identity because there are more pieces here, so the vector spaces are bigger. But what you get is, so you get the new idea of well, the FG is the identity, but GF, well, let's say minus the identity, it's actually, um, it's chain homotopic to the identity. So you can solve this equation. You can write it in this form. You can write it as the commutator of another operator with the boundary operators. And I wanted to just discuss how you um, define this operator. So this operator has, has a piece of dimension 0, a piece of dimension 1, a piece of dimension 2, etc. And it, this operator has degree plus 1, increases the gradient by 1, because the boundary reduces it by 1. So and these operators have degree 0. And, well, so S0 is applied to a vertex. Well, you actually, you just see how you move the vertex. So this vertex, one third of it moved like that, so one third of that vertex goes to this edge here, and one third goes to that edge, and one third goes to that edge. So this vertex goes to the sum of these three. And this vertex moves like that, so it goes to one half of this edge. One half it goes to this edge, one half it goes to that edge. Anyway, so you can define S0, and then if you look at this formula, uh, let's see this term is which. Let's see, this is. Um, so you get the boundary. If you look at this formula, let's see, S1, um, the boundary of that, this will, let's go up, this is starting in dimension 1. The boundary of that will be uh, down one, and then this is boundary, and then S zero. So this is equal to um, GF minus the identity plus S zero boundary. So the idea is that these things will be defined inductively. So you just say what S zero is by just the picture, and then that this is determined, and from the Inductive description, this side here, the boundary of this side here is equal to zero. So this, this has to be checked. And then you want to write this as the boundary of something. Well, you're working inside a cell. A cell has no homology except in degree zero, and I've already gotten off of degree zero. So I can always write this, any cycle can be written as a boundary in a cell because it has no homology. So you can solve this equation, and the solution isn't unique. However, you can make it unique if you, if you add the condition that the, the co-boundary, say you put in some, some thing here, if you want the co-boundary of this to be zero, then, then, then it's a unique solution. So this is sort of a, just a little piece of algebra uh, related to what's familiar in the continuum called Hodge theory, that if you put an appropriate gauge condition, you can solve the equation uniquely. And so, so you you just march up through the cell decomposition, solving these equations uniquely, and then you get you get certain uh, co coefficients and so on. So you can you know you can play around and compute these things. <coughs> And then the new idea, the sort of key new idea of this is that, is that uh, there's a new concept here, which is the idea of two chain complexes being quasi-isomorphic. That means there's a map in each direction, commuting with the boundary operator. Each composition is either the identity or homotopic to the identity, and that's called a quasi-isomorphism. And the idea is that you can move nonlinear structures around via quasi-isomorphisms. So that's, that's the non-trivial idea, uh, which is, let's say, has been appreciated, started to become appreciated in the last 20 years or so. And that's going to be the main workforce power of whatever is, is derived.
derived here. Uh, uh, I want to make a, some remarks. Just for convenience, I'm using this particular subdivision. Let's make some remarks about this. Remarks about the pair subdivision. Sigma less than or equal to tau less than sigma eta. 
there are signs here which I don't, didn't work out. Uh, sigma tau tensor tau eta. So there's a concrete formula, and this is a co-associative compatible with the differential co-product. And the dual the dual object would be an associative compatible with the co-boundary co-product. But it would, it's, it's associative but not commutative. Continuum, and you actually. 
actually had a connection, what you could do is the fiber over every vertex could be identified to the, to say you have the original model and connection. You could identify the fiber over each vertex to the group. Then the parallel translation along the edge would give you an isomorphism between the fiber here and the fiber here. This is given by right translation by some unique element, and that's the element that you put here. Now, this is ambiguous according to the, because you can change this isomorphism over the, the vertices. Uh, and so the labeling by the G's has a fairly big group acting on it. Now, this maximal tree, this tree idea over here actually removes almost all the ambiguity. In other words, you, you take your tree and your, whatever your grid is, and you just take one isomorphism over that point, and then you push it along the tree to every other point to get the isomorphisms at every other point. And then, uh, and then you write down your connection in those terms, and then the only ambiguity is the isomorphism at that one point. So that's a, removes most of the ambiguity. You can see that that little trick there is good. So we're sort of in that context. Let's say we look at it that way. And now I need a, I've been talking about co-algebras. Now I need an algebra. So let A be a differential gradient algebra. And I'm, I'm going to think of, you can, let's think of uh, modeling the chains on G. So take some system of chains for G. And, and uh, I'm not going to worry about what that choice is. In fact, I'm going to think of the zero chains as being, you know, any point in any element of G is like a vertex, so we'll think of that as a zero chain. So this, and I want to think of this having all these properties, so it's kind of big right now, but the Again, this strong idea is that you can always, every discussion will be invariant under quasi-isomorphism. So we can, once we make the discussion in one convenient frame, then we can change the discussion for computation to a much smaller frame using some quasi-isomorphism. Uh, okay. So now I'm, now I'm giving a definition. So this object here is not really topologically copacetic. It's not really OK. It's, it's, it needs to be completed. Uh, uh, and so this is, so this is a, a definition of a completed. Tau 1 plus tau 2. So 
So this is like the usual thing one starts with. So this again, the homomorphisms of C lower dot to A dot of degree 1 minus 1. This object, when you think, think of it as a cochain, because it's palm of the chains into something, has degree plus 1. So this is sort of like a connection that has degree plus 1. Um, see, sorry, this satisfies the Moya Carton equation, which is, see, this is an element in this Hom space. You know, the harm of two things, this little private computation, this is equal to C bar star tensor A. You know, harm of something into something is the isomorphism of the tensor product in the dual space, tensor to something. This has a differential, this has a differential, so the tensor product has a differential, which I'll call, so the differential in here I'll call this. Satisfies this equation plus tau star tau equal to zero. A tau is an element in here, which is in here, which is the same as this. This is a coalgebra, so the dual space is an algebra. This is an algebra. The tensor product of two algebras is an algebra. And uh, that's what this star means, the algebra structure. And I like to go ahead and not use that isomorphism, but to say concretely what it is. You have this co-algebra, you have the co-multiplication, and then you can put tau tensor tau like this, mapping into A tensor A, and then you will multiply A. So this is the tau tensor tau. That's the operation. So it satisfies this equation. What happens to the dimensions under this? What? What happens to the dimensions? I think I've said the dimensions right. Each component, tau i, see, you match from here to here, degree minus 1. Um, I think the dimensions are work, work out. Do you have a specific? Uh, so, well, what is the dimension of tau star tau? Oh. Um, it should be added to. Tau star style. Oh, I see. Well, uh, I see what you're saying. Uh, tau star. I said it had degree one. Well, if I if I use that convention, this operator will have degree plus one. So this will be degree one. This will be degree two. This is one, one, and two. So I use the co-boundary convention. If you think of it as a co-chain, then this differential has degree plus one. Two, two. So let's just look at the first piece of this. This is the reduced thing. So when I look at the co-product, so, so let me give an example. Uh, so for example, you, you expand this all out, you know, take this differential, multiply, you get a, a sequence of quadratic equations. And let's look at the first one. It says boundary of tau 2 plus tau 1 star tau 1 is equal to 0. So we put in a, we put in a, a 2 simplex. Tau 2 eats a 2 simplex. So let's put in a 2 simplex. And it says that, let's look at this term. Um, uh, applied to a Two-simplex, so I have to take the co-product of the two-simplex, and it's this reduced co-product. Turns out there's going to be two terms. There's going to be, you know, this is less than this. Sigma is less than tau. So sigma is less than eta is less than tau. Sigma is less than eta prime is less than tau. So there's sort of two terms here. So this term here is going to be the um, tau one. It's just reading off. The monodromy. So this is going to give you the parallel translation here, composed with the parallel translation here, minus the parallel translation here, composed with the parallel translation here. So that's this term is essentially the holonomy around this square. So this minus this. And then your 
saying that this, uh, as, a, as a chain in the group, is the boundary of a one chain. So what it's doing is putting it as homotopy between this side and this side. So that's what this equation does there. And if you look at the next equation, like boundary tau 3 plus Three simplex might look like a cube. Let me draw a cube here. Seems like a funny way to draw a cube, doesn't it? These cubes are standing on their Gutsy statement, you know, you approximate 
the continuum with these things. Okay. Now, let me give you a, a sort of a global. Now, this is kind of now maybe a more fancy statement. More, more, more like what you want, maybe. I'm not sure, but we'll see. This equation has a very functorial meaning. So if, you, if you take, let's go to this algebra A. There's a famous construction. It goes back to Annenberg and uh, Carton, just after World War II. I won't, I won't give it a name. It's a famous construction. If you have an algebra, you can form this. If you have a vector space, you can form this. algebra on the, on the space. And then, and, and this has a natural co-algebra structure, namely monomials can be broken into pieces like that. So this has a natural co-algebra structure. Usually think of this as an algebra, it has a natural co-algebra structure. And here we have our other algebra. And it, it has, well, it has the following property. This, this co-algebra structure has the following property. It's in the projection where you send all these to zero, but this thing on to A. Suppose you have any map of a co-algebra into A, then it lifts uniquely to a map of co-algebras from here to here. It's the dual property of the tensor algebra. And this is required, this eventually zero property is required for the statement to be true. If you state it without this, it's false. So I've done, I put the bar here to take care of that. So this is the map of, so there's a, so this tau can be reconsidered as a co-algebra map to here. This has a construction. This has a name. I call it DA. Okay. Now, this thing, this makes sense for any of the vector space, what I said so far. Um, now, this thing has a natural differential because A was a differential graded algebra. So A has two maps, the differential of A and the map from a tensor A to A. If you can take the multiplication, each of these, let's see, you, you, these are graded. You shift these by one, and then you extend D to this whole tensor algebra, and you extend M to this whole tensor algebra. The way you apply it to a monomial issue is you apply it to each pair. And then you apply to each pair and keep the rest. Apply it to this pair, keep the rest. Apply it to this pair, and put all the signs. <coughs> and uh, D is extended in a similar way. And then this entire thing with, with the shift has the same degree. And the associativity means that the square is zero. So this the operator, you get a, uh, a differential graded co algebra what it calls. And D is a co derivation. Zero. And for and this, this, this construction is due to Cartan and Otterberg, or Otterberg and McLean. Then you can ask, when is this map, uh, this map of co output, it actually commutes with D? It turns out it commutes with D if and only if this is true. That's the statement. So the meaning of that equation is it's this natural feeds into this. And now if you apply, if A were the chains on the Lie group, this is a chain model. This is the, a model for the chains on the, on the classifying space of the Lie group. And then this map, this is the chains on the space. This is the chain model for the classifying map of the bundle. And so uh, you can look, you, so you can take uh, the linear functions on, on the homology and pull, pull, pull them back to here and get this concrete formula for the characteristic classes, given that you work all this out. So this is a sort of, uh, in a way, this is sort of a combinatorial churn bay theory. And this is discussed in this thesis, and, and this is definitely in the spirit of those papers. So that would be the complicated answer. In fact, it's force. I mean, this equates exactly what's required to make this work. Okay. So this
gives you an example would be example. This is a, a weak partial solution of a problem I've worked on since I was a graduate student. Suppose you take a geometric, well, a sort of discrete example, a version of a Riemannian manifold. If you take a Riemannian manifold, put a lot of points on it, and draw geodesic lines between them, and break it into cells, and then if they're very small, they're essentially flat. So think of them as actually being flat. So you can approximate any Riemannian manifold by piecewise flat thing. Anyway. More, more generally, we can consider putting together a lot of piecewise flat things and getting a, a geometric object, which, which uh, in a sense, we can approximate any Riemannian manifold with. But also, we have more things because the you know, things don't fit together so nicely in general without assuming it. And then there's a, uh, if you look at the dual one skeleton, there's a natural lattice field here. As you, can, you can take, you know, choose a frame in the middle of each block, and then you can go over to the edge. And along a wall, there's a perpendicular vector on one side, and there's another perpendicular vector on the other side. So you can map, let, take a map that's the identity on the wall to match this vector to, say, minus that vector. And that'll be how you parallel translate through the wall. And then if you go around the co-dimension 2 edge, you'll get some uh, holonomy. And so you have a curvature concentrated along here. And so you get one of these, you get the first term of one of these guys. Uh, now, if they were, if all of these, now, I don't know how to extend these guys in general, but if they're small, Small enough for this argument to work, I can't extend it. And it would be kind of canonical if they were small by just convex hull constructions. And then implicitly, then you have formulas, concrete formulas for the characteristic classes of the, of the geometric object. So it's partial in the sense you'd like to have, and it's weak because it sort of involves a lot of steps, but it is some, something. So the, the characteristic classes of a geometric object, if a certain hypothesis is satisfied, are contained in this discussion. So I think getting close to the end, so I'm going to try to uh, uh, What? Yeah, right, exactly. So this is, uh, well, I was asked to say something. So we have B and wedge and B star, and we have the bracket, and I. So we've discussed this. In some sense, I is just the duality between chains and co-chains. Co I won't worry about that. And we have star. So and this is, uh, what I'm going to say now is motivated by his thesis, Scott Wilson. Uh, it's a, a surprise, really, is that uh, you, know, you have, a, you have a, a picture of Frank Array of the dual decompositions. And there's a combinatorial star here. This cell of this decomposition goes to this cell of this decomposition. So it goes from k to n minus k. And you see, when you take the boundary of this cell, and you took it the dual, that corresponds to the co-boundary of this cell. So it converts chains into co-chains. And that's why you have homology and cohomology are, are the same. Quite great well, that's the proof. That drawing is a good proof. And so, What's actually true, so let's write this as, so these are the chains of one subdivision, these are the co-chains of the dual decomposition, and we have this 
combinatorial star, which is an isomorphism between them. The claim is there's a an approximate isomorphism to differential forms. Let's see, uh, Z. So here we have the co-boundary. C integration over a fine decomposition is an approximate uh, isomorphism between forms of D with this. So this is not a surprise. And so we, we, um, we put, let's see, I'm taking N minus K here and N minus K here just to fix dimension. And then hot star goes from N minus K to K. Now the trivial banal observation, but to appreciate that this is the right observation is takes something. Uh, see, star is a chain isomorphism between this, because it just conjugates this operator and this operator. So star is a chain isomorphism between this and this. It's just called tautology. But now, what's interesting is that there's a commutative diagram with this, an approximate isomorphism between this and this, and this diagram is back to so, that, so this is the first surprise, that the, this D star can be correctly modeled by the ordinary boundary operator. First surprise. And I'll, I'll just say that it's a second surprise. And these are surprises to me. I mean, if you look at this lead bracket here, this is the lead bracket, say, of vector fields or multi-vector fields. Uh, if you have a metric, you could convert this into a bracket on differential forms. And the surprise is that D star is a derivation of the bracket. So only certain people know that that discovered. Okay. Well, who cares? Why is this important? Now, well, I'm really out of time, but um, this co-product and the dual of the product is a non-commutative analog of, of the wedge product. The wedge product is commutative. Now, there's a way to um, take this product take this co-product here and dualize to get a product, there's a way to uh, make this commutative, again, using a completion operation. So you have to add, you systematize this product, and then you add, this is call it M2, say this is the dual of the co-product, co right, this is P dot, squared. Turns out you can find an M3, a whole sequence of higher order products, and again, you put them all together with the boundary operator, and they satisfy the Milwaukee Cartan equation. And this is a model of this is the model of of, of, of which that you have to use. And you can think of these operators as being obtained by see you have these two complexes here that are quasi-isomorphic, and you have a structure here. And the idea of these infinity algebras is that you can transfer them through quasi-isomorphisms, but only in their completed form, and living on their free models, where the information is encoded in a, a differential of square zero. That's the Milwaukee cartan equation. So anyway, I'll just close by saying uh, two things. That, if you transfer this structure to the finite level using this principle, so the idea is you, you, if you want to take a structure here and transfer it to here, you take like two elements, move them up to here, apply the operation, and then move back by the inverse. But because of this chain homotopy, it's not the identity when you go around. This won't satisfy the associativity or commutativity, but then it will up to homotopy. So you put in a homotopy. That's your first thing. And then you keep going and you put in all the higher fillings in. And, 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 and this is 
is how you transfer the structures. You, you transfer it as completed structure. These completed lattice fields can be done the same way. You can transfer them through quasi isomorphisms. Now, this information, let me get to the last one to get the last thing. This thesis, which is just being written up now, if you take this information, this type of information, and you actually work over Z, so you actually do, you don't start from forms. You look at what you have, and you say, well, I can, I know why this is happening, and I can do it directly. I can work over Z. Then, in, in the Nathaniel Rounds thesis, he proves that this information, like this, information like this, with the duality. Uh, and take it up to quasi-isomorphism, up to chain homotopy, is enough to determine the homeomorphism type of a manifold, at least in the simply connected case. So this information is powerful enough to determine the homeomorphism type. This is a conjecture I've had for some years. You could do this, so he's completed that conjecture. <coughs> and so then, then going back, so you, in other words, this information is enough to control lots of things. We'd like to get the diffeomorphism type, but there's no theory known that determines the diffeomorphism type in, in uh, uh, dimension four. So uh, anyway, that's just a dream to try to determine the diffeomorphism type. But uh, well, that's one thing. But so so what what can well so this gives you some confidence that there's some depth in, in these considerations. And so if you want to consider transferring all this so we've done this one, and I, I claim, I mean, uh, I claim this, I claim this, and then now this one here, uh, because this is the derivation uh, of this, then you have a structure here that applies, namely this is a differential Lie algebra, and so then you can transfer it as a differential Lie algebra in the infinity form back to here. So we can build a infinity version of a bracket here. And then, uh, that, uh, let's see here. And, well, this is, and we can, and, and now we can, oh, 